Um, it's, it's really um, a number of things have happened um, in recent times, and I thought it was worth us trying to get uh, up, to, up to speed on that. Uh, but it was also partly prompted by, uh, by the things that have been happening uh, in Bolton, particularly around the Charlie Road scheme and so on. Uh, and I think a lack of understanding um, about where things are actually, um, are actually up to nationally and regionally and how the local situation relates to that. Um, is, is that clear on the screen? It is, yeah, Graham. Yeah, there's no part blacked out or anything because I've had that before. Okay, that's good. No. So, so, so it's, um, it's a bit of a, I've tried to turn it into something that, that where each thing follows on from the last, but it's, it's, to some extent, it's a hodgepodge of things that, are, that I think are relevant at the moment. But I want to start off with a bit of optimism because there are some good things going on in Bolton. Um, we actually have cycling and walking infrastructure, and those are brand new cycleways, brand new pavements that came in, uh, came into use only this year, beginning of the year. And that's great to see. Uh, it's not used very much by people on cycles because, um, uh, because it doesn't yet connect to anything, but that's, that's work in progress. Um, but my wife um, doesn't cycle and she walks a lot and she's found that the pedestrian use of that facility is very good as well. Um, it was horrible whilst the barriers were in and it's a bit horrible again now that some barriers are in for the work around the station. Um, but in general, it's very good for, for cyclists and it's very good for, for pedestrians or people cycling and people walking. Um, we all, we're also seeing in connection with this something that's really important about this, which is public realm improvement. This is about improving our, our urban environment. That's what we're talking about here. Uh, it just so happens that, that how people get around is a big part of that. Um, and the, um, the, the, the area at the front of the station has been a horrible place for quite a long time, ever since the new interchange was built uh, and the old one were, fell into disuse. Um, so, you know, I think it's going to be a really nice introduction to people who come on the train to Bolton to be able to come out of the station to this and be able to walk along Newport Street um, and cycle along Newport Street and so on. So this is this is fantastic stuff. Um, we're also seeing um, some good design where the needs of people cycling and walking and catching public uh, transport are all taken into account. So this example on Bridgman Place uh, is a bus stop. Uh, bypass with quite a wide waiting area for people wanting to catch the bus, um, decent uh, footways and in, eventually when it's finished a decent cycleway. So that's, you know, this is all good stuff. Um, we've also seen uh, in, on, in, only in the last few months a 20 mile an hour speed limit uh, zone across the whole of the town centre everywhere within the outer box, um, the outer uh, road box. Uh, and that again, that, that is really good to see. I mean, I thought that should have happened a long time ago, particularly on, for example, Deansgate, where the buses go down and so on. So it's, 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 it's good stuff. And again, that benefits people cycling, it benefits people walking, it benefits people who are just uh, around on the streets and so on. The fact that people aren't driving quite so fast. Well, hopefully. And then another one, which I, I've struggled to find a picture that shows this, because uh, the benefit in this particular case is there are quite a few pedestrian crossings in uh, certainly in my part of the borough where you now press the button and it immediately turns to amber for motor vehicles and um, and then very quickly to to green for for, for people on foot now I, I see uh, Kay shaking her head I guess it's not everywhere uh, and I, I think particularly those um, uh, crossings that are linked into scoot controlled junctions probably don't have this benefit uh, but at least we're starting to see that happening. And I think that's a good sign. Uh, so this is all good stuff. Um, there's also good news on the national front. Um, Catherine mentioned uh, the DFT funding, uh, tranche three of the emergency active travel stroke, active travel uh, fund. Um, and a bit of detail on that. The letter went out from the DFT to authorities on 14th of June, um, an invitation to bid. The deadline is the 9th of August, and I know it's a very tight deadline, but I know that TFGM are working based on the, um, uh, the, the stuff that we've already got in place for the, the, the design of the B network and so on uh, to come up with, with proposals. They are requiring that all proposals meet the LTN 1 stroke 20 cycle design standard um, and are compliant with that. Um, they should include segregation of cycles from 
motor vehicles and from pedestrians, if you read LTN 120, um, and uh, also point closures, which are part of, uh, of active neighbourhoods. White paint, paint only schemes are not acceptable. They will not be funded. I and mean, then that effectively, that's what we've got now on Trolling Your Road. Um, so, you know, that's, that is an issue. And they're also recognising that there's a problem with capacity in, in local authorities. And so training will be offered as part of this, um, of this tranche of, of funding. Um, they're looking for pol political commitment. So it has to link into the local walking and siphoning infrastructure plans, uh, which in Greater Manchester means the made to move strategy and the B network and so on. So we, we're in a very good place uh, to show that side of the commitment. Uh, they're requiring community consultation, but they specifically say this does not mean giving anyone a veto, requiring consensus or prioritizing the loudest voices. Uh, this is about how we do it, not whether we do it. Uh, it also requires a written sign off by the council leader. And I think that's uh, what um, uh, Catherine was referring to earlier, that, um, that there needs to be confidence that schemes will be signed off by the, the leadership of the councils uh, if TFGM are going to bring them forward. Um, for larger schemes, there will actually be a di design review that's run by Active Travel England, which is not yet in place, but it is uh, being developed. So, so you know, it's, it's all uh, well thought out, I think. Um, there are also very clear criteria that the DFT have defined for how these proposals will be assessed. And there are four items, four criteria. Propensity to convert short vehicle journeys into cycling, walking, resulting in carbon, air quality and congestion benefits. So that's very clear. They're looking to uh, give people the opportunity to not drive everywhere. Uh, tackling areas with poor health outcomes and with high levels of deprivation. Now, one of the problems that, that uh, I think has been around pretty much everywhere where these uh, initiatives have, 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 have been tried is that it's, it's relatively easy to get engagement from people who live in the more affluent areas. It's more difficult to get engagement from people who live in areas of deprivation and so on. Uh, so you know, that's something that really uh, needs some attention paid to it. Um, they'll also take into account how many people will benefit from the measures. So what's the potential for, for the number of people uh, that will benefit? And then compliance with the key principles, which are on the previous slides. And, uh, and actually, there's more than just the one I've put in there. The letter also contains some other measures, as well as these infrastructure and training uh, funding. Uh, and they're inviting expressions of interest for that. The first one is Mini, Mini Holland's development programme. Now, one of the things that's been done in London, and we've seen uh, actually a presentation about Waltham Forest last year, um, where the, it's, it's, it's like a collection of active neighbourhoods linked by, um, by walking and cycling facilities between them on main roads. Uh, and it's called a Mini Holland in, in London. They're talking about here moving that outside London and doing similar things. Now, looking at, I've never been to Waltham Forest or Enfield, but looking at the pictures and videos, it actually is a much nicer place to be uh, than it was before, as far as I can see, and certainly than uh, somewhere like Bolton or anywhere in Greater Manchester for that matter. And then the other one that's interesting is a GP prescribing pilot. So they did say some time ago that they wanted to bring in uh, prescribing of activity um, for, for GPs. So social prescribing of walking and cycling. Uh, so there's support, they, they're asking for support from the clinical commissioning um, group and the, um, uh, the oh, what's it called? PCN. We need, um, we need primary care to, network. Oh, that's it, yes, yeah. Um, primary care network, yeah. Um, four authorities will be shortlisted. Um, I don't know, I, well, I, I don't know whether Bolton will be shortlisted. I don't think it's even worth Bolton putting something in because it has to link into cycling and walking infrastructure measures. And I don't think we're at that stage yet where it's, uh, where it's really going to be possible uh, to meet this. But, uh, but it, it's there and it's a recognition that it's really important to give people the, the opportunity to become more active. I mentioned the miracle pill there. And I'm going to come back to that. So why the urgency over all of this? And there is urgency. If you look at government and, um, and pretty much everywhere, uh, there's a lot of urgency over this. Well, that miracle pill that I mentioned, it, I would recommend anybody reads this book by Peter Walker, which is, uh, is, is about a year old now. Um, I read it. I went into it thinking, well, it's only going to be all the same stuff that I've been reading for the last 10 years. But actually, it's a real eye opener because it made me realise that it's not simply a lack of activity that's a problem. 
the actual time you spend inactive is itself harmful. If you sit for two hours, that is doing you damage. It's not just that you're not active, it's that you're actually inactive. Uh, and you get immediate benefits from, uh, from becoming active. And all of this inactivity is actually costing the NHS a fortune. And right now, the NHS, we need to take the pressure off the NHS uh, because they've got a, an incredible backlog. I mean, the figures are absolutely horrendous in terms of how many, um, how long the waiting lists are now for, for, for non-COVID related uh, things. So something has to be done about that. Um, it's also important, of course, to recognise, and I, I'm sort of recapping things we, we talked about last September here, uh, gear change was brought out uh, in August, in July of last year, um, which is the, um, the, the government strategy for all this. And, it, and it's interesting to look at the benefits, you know, healthier, happy, greener communities, safer streets, convenient and accessible travel. And these are the sorts of things that, uh, that are being aimed at. And those benefits can actually be quantified and they're absolutely phenomenal. And we've been saying this for years and, and nothing seems to, to, to happen as a result. With a 13 to one return on investment, it's hard to see why anyone wouldn't borrow to invest in this. I mean, with that kind of return on investment, there, there is, I don't think there's any other uh, national investment that can bring anything like that kind of uh, return on investment. Key design principles are in there, and this is just illustrating what we're talking about. And we've used this picture a few times, that lady in the bottom right-hand corner, that's the sort of person we're talking about when we say someone cycling. It's someone who's going down to the shops, going to, to work, going to, uh, uh, to a cafe, going to meet a friend, some, some, those sorts of things. And it's a pleasant environment, and there's lots of space for walking and, and just being there and, um, and communicating with other people. Why these particular modes? Well, they actually provide good coverage of the uh, of the range of distances. Walking up to about a mile, so one, one and a half kilometres. Cycling uh, from about one kilometre up to about, um, well, 10 kilometres, actually. That's about seven miles. Um, that's not an unreasonable distance to be cycling. And then beyond that, public transport. Um, and where it's necessary, uh, private motor vehicles, if, um, if it, if, the, the public transport isn't, isn't suitable for that particular purpose at the time. So that's why these modes are there, uh, are being uh, addressed. Now, the other thing, another thing to remember is the climate emergency. It's now nearly two years since Bolton Council declared a climate emergency. Um, I've put on the left there, this area is intentionally left blank because I haven't seen anything come out yet. The council has asked lots of questions about this and that's great, you know, they're consulting the, uh, the community um, about it, but we really need to start seeing the, the plans for how uh, the town is going to, uh, to, to address this issue. And it's worth looking uh, in more depth at that. It, the, one of the things that one of the advisory groups to the government is a statutory body called the Climate Change Committee, which was set up in legislation about five years ago. Um, and in their most recent report to Parliament, they, they made their one of their priorities for 2021 to 22 public transport and active travel. And that's that's taken from their report, which was published uh, last month. So, you know, this is really high up the agenda right now. There's also, today was published the Transport Decarbonisation Plan, and um, uh, Grant Shapps made a, a big speech about it. There's been mixed reactions to it. Some people think it's too weak. I actually agree with some of the, uh, of the criticisms on that. Uh, there's still too much commitment to, uh, to building large numbers of new roads for, you know, the 30 odd thousand, 30 odd million pounds uh, sorry, 30 odd billion pound investment uh, in um, road building. Nevertheless, it does contain a lot of stuff that from the point of view of what we're looking at is really good. I was quite pleased to see the, the statement from Grant Shapps that this is not just about how you get around. It's about our environment. It's about the public realm. It's about making the place a nice place to live. And despite what, we, what, what was said earlier, I think one of the things that has really damaged our environment for people is too many cars moving about, going too fast, uh, parked all over the place. There is hardly a, a residential street in the town where you can just walk side by side along the footway. And I agree absolutely with what, what, uh, what um, Anne and, uh, and Kay were saying about that. Uh, we walk quite a lot and, uh, and we do a large proportion of it in single file. 
and sometimes even have to walk out in the road to, uh, to get past. So that's not good. It says there are good things, you, that, that transport strategy can shape things for good or for bad. Bad is spending longer and longer stuck in traffic, huge increase in rat running down roads which were never meant for it. Millions of people literally being poisoned by the very air they breathe. You know, this is good stuff to see in this, uh, in this plan because, uh, because it's, it's, it's really important and it's extremely urgent. We keep talking about 2030 being the, the cutoff date, because that's when you, you're not allowed to, to, to sell a petrol or diesel car, for example. Uh, we've not got that much time. That's nine years away. We need to do some things quicker. And the plan actually recognises that. What it says is, we cannot pile ever more cars, delivery vans and taxis onto the same congested urban roads. I was going to put a picture of Blackburn Road on here because that, you know, you could go any time on Blackburn Road and get a good picture for this particular point. Um, that will be difficult for the roads, let alone the planet. It will be essential to avoid a car led recovery. That's in the government's decarbonisation plan, a core element of the DFT's plans. I'll repeat that. It will be essential to avoid a car led recovery. And we really have to stress that and keep stressing it over and over again. They've published ambitious policies to transform England for cycling and walking. That's the gear change uh, strategy that I mentioned earlier. And so again, there's this, this uh, emphasis on alternatives to, uh, to driving. Um, it was quite an eye opener. One of the, the uh, pictures in there was of the, um, uh, the, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions by different modes of transport. And well over half of it is private cars and taxis. And so, you know, that is the area where we really need to, where that really needs to be addressed. And if you just, re just remember the, um, what I showed earlier, the Climate Change Committee, they actually singled out transport as the area that is way behind in trying to address this out of all of the different sources of, um, of greenhouse gases and so on. So what they, um, they defined in the strategy, uh, some specific priorities, and I've just picked those out. This is the last slide on this. Uh, this this one number one priority accelerating modal shift to public and active transport that's their number one priority after that number two priority is electric vehicles and that sort of thing which isn't going to solve the problems it helps but it's not going to solve the problems uh, and then the same for um, for transport and I, it was quite good that they actually show uh, even in that decarbonizing how we get our goods they've also shown a cargo cycle on there uh, and you know in countries where the, the right infrastructure is in place this is how people do the last mile deliveries you know copenhagen and places like that, that that's just how you do it and it doesn't matter if there are hills because they're electric now so this is this is uh, really really critical and, and that's good to see now all of this is important but where people where councils and um, and governments and regions have tried to do this there's the usual backlash and that is now starting to result in litigation. I think this is really important to look at. Um, I mentioned earlier in, I think it was February, that there was um, a judgment had been made against Transport for London over its uh, street space um, plans um, uh, program. Um, and it was very much misreported. It was, uh, it was reported, and I have to say, by one of our most senior councillors in a meeting that I was at, and I had to pick that up, uh, that uh, this is actually showing that all of the cycleways and uh, and so on everywhere are going to be ripped out because they're all illegal. I mean, that's basically what people were saying. Actually, it was nothing of the sort. It was actually um, the London taxi drivers saying that their special status uh, in law hadn't been recognised. Uh, that's as anyway, that uh, judgment has now been overturned on appeal and uh, London will just be carrying on and going ahead with their, their schemes now. So that's good news. Kensington High Street, this is a very famous one, um, a cycleway with light protection. Look at these blooming ones. They don't even have orcas, these ones, they're just ones. Um, it was removed by the council before the trial completed. Um, the uh, Royal Bor Borough of Kensington and Chelsea actually used lots of delaying tactics and, uh, and things to try and head off um, the, uh, the legal action. But on the 18th of June, the local action group on this Better Streets for Kensington and Chelsea have actually started legal proceedings against uh, Kensington, uh, the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how that comes out. There's, uh, they seem to have quite a strong case. And then the last one I want to look at on this is um, 
oh no, this is not the last one. There's one after this. Um, Shoreham in West Sussex. There was a very successful cycle lane delineated by these blooming ones. And mm. I think they look great. They look a damn sight better than cars parked on the pavement and Chelsea tractors and so on. Um, but um, the council just removed that without any consultation for anyone. And it was really well used. It, the, the mon they did, there was some monitoring in there and it was used by all sorts of people, like the lady that's shown in that picture, children going to school and so on. Um, Cycling UK is pursuing this now um, and they're requesting a judicial review um, and they're still uh, pushing forward on that. And basically, like all of these things, it's about whether the council has acted reasonably and whether it has um, has followed the right procedures, whether it's followed its own policies and these sorts of things. These actions are not about the uh, whether uh, walking and cycling infrastructure is good or bad. They're about whether councils have actually done it properly. Uh, and then finally, Lambeth, um, Railton Low Traffic Neighbourhood, which has been a very, very successful uh, low traffic neighbourhood. Uh, there was a legal challenge brought by a disabled resident and the local anti uh, LTN pressure group won Lambeth, um, claiming that uh, there were various aspects of this that were unlawful. And again, that claim has been rejected in the High Court. So this is all good news. Uh, it's just disappointing that it takes expensive and time consuming legal action to make this happen because people could be designing good schemes rather than rather than having to, to pursue all of this. But but in that in this in, in the sense that the courts are making sensible decisions, then it's um, or what I consider sensible decisions, then it's good. I think it's good news. Now, as well as the uh, the litigations that are that are coming along, and I think we'll see a lot more of those now. Uh, there are also other consequences, and I just want to remind uh, people of something that, uh, again, was in the gear change document about Active Travel England, which is currently being uh, put forward. The, the, uh, man, the, the leading roles have actually been advertised, so recruitment is happening uh, to the roles in there. And uh, the inspectorate has a role in relation to funding, so the carrots there, but it also has um, an inspectorate role, which is actually to do with making sure that people across the country are doing all this stuff and doing it properly. And I'm gonna come back and pick some points out of that in a moment, but I just wanted to show you that they actually do mean what they say in here. This is a letter that went on the same day as the DFT uh, invitation for bids to the Active Travel Fund tranche three uh, went, and it was to West Sussex Council, remember the Shoreham one, that's in West Sussex. Um, and I'll just pick out the key things from that. It's saying that they're setting out the reasons why West Sussex Council will not be invited to bid for funding this year. Uh, the schemes delivered, the citing reasons, the schemes delivered under tranche one of the Emergency Active Travel Fund were not allowed to be fully tested and or optimised before the schemes were removed. Sounds familiar to me. Uh, and then they do throw a little bit of hope. It says, I hope that in delivering your tranche two schemes, you build on the lessons learned from tranche one, which would put uh, West Sussex County Council in a strong position to bid for funding in future years. Uh, now, there's a bit more to that story because um, it just happens that the main opponent, who was the, um, who was the, uh, the executive member uh, responsible for all of this, uh, has actually now been replaced and there are moves to try and get the DFT to change their mind but there's the 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 word on the street as you say is that they're probably not going to to change their minds because um, because they need to to show that they mean business on this now in greater manchester there's we're sort of protected we we have a different structure we're a unitary authority within a, a combined authority um in uh, West Sussex, the structure is different. So Shoreham didn't have much choice over this. West Sussex Council, County Council uh, made the decision for them. Uh, so it's different. And I was going to ask um, Catherine, you know, what's the position for combined authorities and, um, and in places like us? And I think we've had some hints, at least so far in the meeting, as to what the position is here. So the key points then to take away from this is are... Uh, again, from the from the gear change document, we will not allow any other agency or body to fund such schemes using any of DFT's money. So schemes that don't meet the requirements. And uh, um, this includes schemes delivered through other pots of money, such as the Transforming Cities Fund. So, you know, it's there are things that we're actually getting getting benefit from uh, from some of these. Uh, Bolton is getting benefit from some of these kinds of funds. 
And then finally, Active Travel England's assessment of authority and authority's performance on active travel will influence the funding it receives for other forms of transport from DFT. So that means that councils that don't participate in the active travel uh, changes will find it difficult to get funding from DFT. That's basically the threat there, and I think they, I think they mean it. Okay, now, of course, how do councils make sure they don't fall foul of the law and get into trouble with all of this stuff with DFT? Well, it comes down to planning and policies. So I'm gonna say a little bit about that. Um, we've already covered this um, actually in the Bolton context, and I'm gonna pull back some, pull out some slides that I presented two and a half years ago when I did a review of Bolton's policies. Uh, but it was quite pleasing to see this um, headline in Salford, um, that the uh, Salford actually, uh, rejected plans for a new little store uh, and they said that it's that one of the reasons was the design fails to maximize the potential movement of pedestrians and cyclists through and around the site and fails to minimize potential conflicts between pedestrians cyclists and other road users now that is something that's quite i think that's quite a, a landmark there because i don't think we've ever seen anything like that uh, in most of the, the boroughs and uh, most of the districts in Greater Manchester. And certainly I'm pretty sure we've never seen anything like that in Bolton. So what is that all about? Well, of course, you have to have the policies in place. And Bolton does have the policies in place. And these are slides that I showed, as I said, two and a half years ago. The core strategy, which has been in place now since March 2001, uh, 2011, says objective number one the very first objective for the core strategy of bolton is to in, is it contains a commitment to increase opportunities for walking and cycling policy p5 in that same section says the council and its partners will ensure that developments take the following into account possibly um, words that could be uh, sort of wriggled out of there take into account but accessibility by different types of transport prioritizing pedestrians cyclists public transport users over other motorized vehicle users now that is really important and i think we need to hold the council to account on that because there are lots of developments where this isn't hasn't been happening policy tc11 relates specifically to the town center and things are looking a bit better on that because again safety consistency and accessibility particularly for pedestrians cyclists cyclists and users of public transport well we are seeing some of that and and it's taken a while it's you know it's almost a decade now since that was put in place but we are seeing things and the 20 mile an hour speed limit the um, the cyclops junctions and so on these are all contributing to that so that's you know thanks to the council for uh, for actually doing that there are also supplementary planning documents, and I'm not going to go into those because I went into them uh, all, that, all that time ago, and you can look at that report um, again if you want. Um, but section seven and section eight uh, in, are about provision for pedestrians and provision for cyclists, and I think it's well worth reading those again. It also brings, uh, invokes the Manual for Streets and LTN 208, which was the predecessor to LTN 1. 20, which is the one that's, uh, that's now in place. And the interesting thing that I found in the difference between those two, apart from the fact that LTN 120 is much bigger, is that LTN 120 actually says a lot about walking as well as cycling. And I think that's really good. And it talks about the public realm and, and the sorts of improvements that we need to see uh, in that context. It also talks about the hierarchy of users. And I guess that's what a lot of this stuff is, is based on. Cy pedestrians first, then cyclists, then public transport users, then specialist service vehicles, and then other motor traffic, private cars, and so on. If you want to look at that report, it's quite a big one, but you can see it uh, at that address. And, and this, um, this presentation is actually in the, um, the, the Google Drive folder. Okay, so that's all done, of course, within a national planning policy. And so, I mean, what I, what I want to do, I'm trying to paint a picture of a massive transformation that's happening across the country that Bolton can either be part of uh, willingly or can be dragged along kicking and screaming on. Um, the National Planning Policy Framework is where this is all defined. It says it sets out the government's planning policies for England and how these should be applied. And one of the first things it talks about is in all planning, there should be a presumption in favour of sustainable development. Now, that means economic sustainability, social sustainability and environmental sustainability. Sections eight and nine talk about healthy and safe communities, 
and sustainable transport. So I just want to uh, pick some things quickly out of, uh, out of those. There's a lot of words on here, but I've highlighted some bits that I think are important. The first thing it says is really, I think is really good. It says that, um, that uh, planning policy should promote social interaction. One of the things that our car dependent society has actually done that damages our whole society is that it means people don't actually get to see one another. People don't talk to one another anymore because they go out the front door, get in the car, go to where they're going, and then you know they, they don't meet anywhere else. And they're actually picking that up in here as, uh, as part of this, um, this planning document. And in that context, it talks about easy pedestrian and cycle connections. Uh, another thing that uh, is in that particular section is to enable and support healthy lifestyles, allow people to uh, include activity into their daily lives rather than having to go to a gym uh, or whatever to to uh, to get that activity so safe and accessible green infrastructure layouts that encourage walking and cycling this is all built into the uh, to the, um, the the policies of the country regarding uh, planning and then the nine, nine that i mentioned promoting sustainable transport well transport issues should be considered from the earliest stages and one of the things in that that it is so that opportunities to promote walking, cycling, and public transport use are identified and pursued. That um, these particular ones, uh, you'll see in a moment some of the, the wording that looks familiar. Planning policies should provide for high quality walking and cycling networks. Uh, and that should be done in, in, um, in the context of the LC WIPs, which is in our case, the uh, made to move and, and so on. Uh, applications for development should give priority first to pedestrian and cycle movements, both within the scheme and the neighbouring areas. That's clearly the wording that Salford have used in their rejection of that planning application. And the next one, even more, um, create places that are safe, secure and attractive, which minimise the scope for conflicts between pedestrians, cyclists and vehicles. So again, Salford is obviously drawing on those national planning guidelines as the reason for reject or one of the reasons for rejecting that particular planning application. And that's that's great to see. It also provides some definitions, and I think this is quite interesting. Sustainable transport modes, what it defines what it means by those, which is good. It also talks about transport assessments and travel plans, which are quite important. And again, it talks about alternatives to the car. Um, and uh, in, in the travel plan part, it talks about sustainable transport objectives, which uh, one of which is to um, the national uh, sustainable transport objective. Uh, one of them, the objectives is to uh, make 50% of journeys um, carried out in England, at least uh, walking or cycling. Uh, then it talks about spatial development strategies. So it talks about the strategic level, not just the, 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 the planning level. And there it talks about um, a spatial development strategy. And of course, we've been working, Greater Manchester has been working on a spatial development strategy for a long time. In, in, com in combined authorities, uh, this part of it is delegated to the combined authority. So I, think it's, it, I thought it's worth having a quick look at what's going on at the, uh, the Greater Manchester level on that. So the spatial framework actually, um, as, as the spatial framework died in December when Stockport withdrew its, um, its participation. And it was felt that it was not actually appropriate for the others to go forward with the same structure uh, of 10 uh, local authorities. Uh, so in March 2021, it was agreed that a joint committee would be set up between the remaining nine districts to set up to create um, a, a new spatial plan. Uh, and that uh, spatial plan is now being developed and it's going to be called Spaces for Everyone, Places for Everyone. So, um, one of the things that happened uh, to, to get that in place was that all of those nine councils uh, had the same uh, motion to vote on, just with the name of the particular uh, council substituted. And in Bolton, it said, enable Bolton and the other eight districts to continue to progress the strategic policies of G uh, Greater Manchester Special Framework 2020, which commanded widespread support. So whilst the name is dead, what was in it isn't dead. Um, and it also says align with, with wider Greater Manchester strategies for transport and other infrastructure investment. So there, as far as transport's concerned, we're talking about the TFGM plan, we're talking about the 2040 vision and uh, the transport elements of that, uh, and the TFGM business plan, which, uh, which we talked about last year. 
Now, what does what did the spatial framework itself say specifically about that? Well, it was in policy GM Strat 4, a sustainable and integrated transport network. And it's interesting to see that that's in there. The transport network will be improved so that half of all daily trips can be made by public transport, cycling and walking. So that's a local uh, Greater Manchester objective, especially those shorter journeys around neighbourhoods. Uh, and that is what has resulted in the Streets for All strategy that, um, that's actually just seeing the light of day now. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about that and then I'll finish. Um, the second thing in that, uh, that, that was of note in there was new development will have a significant role in developing Greater Manchester's future sustainable and integrated, integrated transport network in order to reduce car dependency and increase levels of cycling, walking, and public transport. And of course, Chris Borden has been appointed to make sure that that happens. And uh, so Streets for All, the first one, that is actually taken from the, um, uh, the Combined Authority uh, summary of the Streets for All strategy, uh, and it gives you an idea of what it's all about. And right at the centre is green, as in ecologically green, vibrant place streets that are welcoming places to spend time in. Not about how you get about necessarily, it's just making the place nicer to be. Uh, so that is the first thing on the left there, place-based agenda. And you can see, oh, I'm not going to go through all of those, but you can actually um, read that. At, that's, that link um, will take you to the, uh, to the document on the, in the combined authority. That will go to the combined authority for approval at the end of this month. So hopefully that will go through and we'll start to see things happen there. And then the other one I mentioned was the Greater Manchester Transport Commissioner, um, Chris Boardman. Uh, basically, his brief has been expanded from... Uh, just active travel, walking and cycling, uh, to, uh, and he, the way he describes it is, everything people need to not have to drive. That's how Chris Boardman himself uh, described the scope of his, his role. So the focus is about making it possible for people to get about without driving. Now, there was a very good uh, question and answer that, uh, that Chris Boardman uh, prepared for Walk Ride GM. He couldn't be at the meeting, uh, but it was about a month ago, there was a, there was a Walk Ride GM meeting. Um, and I'm gonna try and show that. I don't 